Well, good morning again. It's good to be here in the house of the Lord. It's good to preach the Word of God. It's good to study the Bible and hear the Word of God for each and every person. You know, in, uh, I'll forget what exactly year it was, about around the turn of the century, I guess it was, the people in the Brethren Church, the Brethren Society, and not point any fingers, it's, it's, uh, it affects uh, they're different uh, my mind don't work sometimes it's not different religions it's different okay. denominations that's the word I'm looking for it went somewhere but it come by <laughs> different denominations but the brother, brother denomination and around the turn of the century sometime the first of all the brother was a plain known as a plain people if you look back at pictures and look back at whatever the what they wore were they were the plain people they wore mostly brown or dark clothing to church nothing fancy and they were known as the bearded ones they always wore beards that goes back to the bible you know the nazarenes you don't shave your beard you're a bearded person you don't stand out among people prideful you're plain around the turn of the century some of the brethren started, that's when about the time factories started up in the cities and things like that. And some of the brethren were work tired of farming, worked tired of running the printing press. They had one of the first printing presses. We're going over here, we're going to work in the city, in the town. Well, they did. They went to work in the town. Them people didn't dress like that, so they started dressing like the other people. A lot of them people had uh, shaven faces, so some of them shaved their beards off. But all this happened around the turn of the century. That's about the time that the brethren took the spit tunes out of the aisle. If you chewed the back and you sat there where John is, and you had the spit tune there side of it. That's about the same time the Presbyterians took the ashtrays off the pulpit. But anyway... If you go and look at all that stuff, about that time, you notice now that there are brethren churches and there are churches of the brethren. And if you go to the Mennonites, there's a Old Order Mennonites and a whatever Mennonites. And if you go to the Presbyterians, there's a little difference there. Well, what I'm saying is, the other day, a young man asked me, he was about 12 years old. He asked me, he said, Roger, why are there so many churches? Did you ever think of that? Why are there so many churches? You know, I had to do a study of when we, I was in whatever you want to call it, minister training, church seminary, whatever. From my house uh, as a center point, they wanted us to go to three and a half mile or four mile, five mile, whatever it was there. Again. See how many churches was there? That's when we was in church church planting there was 15 in that circle around my house five miles people used to ride a horse that far to go to church but now there's 15 there why are there so many churches I got to thinking on that and I wrote down some reasons and the reasons as Alan says makes you think because it talks about me. There are so many churches because of people like me. People like I used to be. People like I don't want to be but am sometimes anyway. And them reasons for so many churches are disagreements. You believe that? Unforgiveness. Selfishness. Unmerciless people. That are the reason, that's the reason there are so many churches. All them things, disagreements, unforgiveness, selfishness, unmerciless, all them have one eye. That's one eye. They got the other chunk you can't see out of it. You know, if you've been in churches and people, there's people that live for their self. You know, they're not caring. That's still one eye. Prideful, that's still one eye. You know, people are letting traditions and self-judgment 
overrides what church is all about. You believe that? But especially with this, um, like a man come and spoke to me this week and told me he's worried about his church. It wasn't this church, but he's worried about his church. But with this virus and all this going around, you know, Satan has, I preached on Sunday about Satan getting his foot in the door with sins and all this. Satan has a plan. Satan's plan is to, de to defeat Jesus Christ. It ain't going to happen, people. But his plan is to defeat Jesus Christ. And it says a cord of three strands is not easily broken. It's not. A cord of one strand is easily broken. If Satan can divide and conquer this church and any other, he will. If Satan can, but one thing, if he can find something to divide the church, he will. And we got to be careful. I do not want to see churches. You see, with this virus going on, you see people not going to church, people afraid to go to church, people arguing in churches about singing, about coming to church, about seating, about wearing masks, about not wearing masks, all this. But if we go back and look at this, the judgment thing and the forgiveness thing, you know, there's, I tell this story a lot. There was uh, you know, one church where I was, the church I was raised in. There was actually, and some of you have heard me say this, but don't forget it. This, it ain't supposed to work this way. There was an elderly lady that her son brought her to church. And if he pulled up in church and she saw this other vehicle sitting there, which belonged to this other woman she didn't like, she would have her son turn around and take her back home. If she got there first and the other lady come to church and seen that she was there or saw met her son going back out the road, they lived one here and one up on the hill. But this, they was, and from the time I was big as Ben, this went on until those ladies passed away. Or one of them did. I think the other still lived. But it was over a piece of cloth in the women's sewing circle that one got and the other didn't. That's what it was about. You know, that did stuff like that divides churches. Stuff like, you know, if I don't like the shirt, the shirt Byron's wearing, and I I call pull him aside when he goes out the door today and say, Byron, I don't think you're gonna wear that church, that's your church anymore. It's blue. You know what that means? <laughs> Well, no, what's it mean? It means it's blue to me. But, you know, if we if we go on like that with things, the judgment, you know, there's been church separated because of how people dress. There's been churches separated because of how people, what they sing. There's been churches separated because of a piano. There's been churches separated because somebody brought a guitar in the church and started playing the guitar. What We want to stick that piano. We don't want no guitars in our church. That's rock music. That's from Satan and hell is what that's from. They don't realize the piano comes from the saloon down the street to the first church. <laughs> Boy, how many times has David mentioned in there, praise the Lord with their piano? You read the book of Psalms. It don't say about the piano. It says the dulcimer and the harp and the stringed instruments. There's been people in churches divided because people, the way they worship. You ever go to the Pentecostal church? They'd be up here hollering, hooping, rolling on the floor, whatever else, praising the Lord. Praising. The Bible says, lift your hands into the Lord and worship him. Well, that fellow's crazy. We don't want him in our church. You know what that looks like? Him up there rolling around the floor, hollering, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. What would they have did? They had a heart attack if they'd seen David dancing naked in the street. Praise the God. <laughs> you know, think about that. But churches are separated because of these things. I do not want to see that happen to any church, this church or any church. People, you know, I can ask different people if, you know, how many people in here, just raise your hand, how many people like turnips? Turnips. No. All right, that's a third, maybe. How many like ice cream? Hey, 
Hey, we got more. This church here is going to sponsor ice cream. We ain't going to sponsor turns. You know, think about that. How many times, and if you go five years from now, think about five years when you went to a church and you was mad at somebody in that church about something that happened in that church. Does it make any difference now? No. We all worship one Jesus, the same Jesus. We all worship the same God, the Holy Spirit, same Holy Spirit it is in all of us. And I've mentioned before, it don't matter what color the carpet is. It don't matter if we got stained windows, if we got a steeple on the church or we don't. You know, you can go on and on. Church of separate because of baptism. Do you baptize three times or once in the name of Jesus, in the name of the Holy Spirit, Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost? Forwards or backwards, which is right. You know, you go back to the, the brethren's study. I don't like picking on the brethren, but this is just because I know a lot about it because I studied it. You know, the, the church has started splitting when I talked about them being the bearded people. Well, one the one bunch of the story you read wanted them to shave because they... Uh, took the heart of what the Bible says about greeting with the holy kiss. And they said, in verse two tobacco, that stuff gets all through the beard. I ain't kissing him. If he shaves, and maybe it'll be cleaned up a little anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it just keeps dividing. But still inside, we are the same person working for the same God. I don't care if you're a Presbyterian, a brother, a Baptist, or whatever. And we got to learn that. If you go to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 6, no, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 5, verse 38. There's a lot in here of, that if we abide by, the reason, the main, the answer to why are there so many churches is that people are not following the commandments of God. That's just a jest of it. If we follow the commandments of God, he mentioned this morning, what is the greatest commandment? Love thy Lord with all thy heart, all thy soul, and all thy mind, and your neighbor as yourself. That's not Matthew 5, but anyway. If you go to Matthew 5, starting verse 38, it talks about an eye for an eye. You ever hear that? I remember preachers preaching that. An eye for an eye, what the Bible says. Yeah, what did Jesus say? But I say unto you, not an eye for an eye, but that you resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. I ain't saying if somebody walks up to you in your church and smacks you upside the head on the right side, you turn the other side to hit him again. <laughs> We're going to get to that directly. We're going to get to forgiving. We're going to get to being loving our neighbor as ourself is to not hit him to start with. You know what I'm saying? If any man will sue you or sue thee at the law and take away your coat, let him have that cloak also. You know, have there been disagreements in church about who gets the carpet when they take it out and replace it? Yes. Been disagreements in church about any other things? Yes. If we are a child of God and follow God's commandments and the word of God, what Jesus said, we're going to get along with other people. We're going to have, as I go back to Alan all the time, he ought to be a preacher. He was preaching, this, teaching, preaching this morning, Sunday school class. And what was it? Slow to, slow to listen. Yeah, slow to listen, quick to listen. You know, the Bible talks about being slow to speak, quick to listen. It talks about being having all that mixed up. How many times are we quick to speak and slow to listen if we got a problem with somebody? You know, we treat people in our church one way because they're strangers. We treat our children or our spouse another way. Have you ever talked to anybody in your church like you would not talk to your wife or husband? I probably have. I'd probably got slapped if I talked to my wife that way sometimes. <laughs> but did God want me to do that? No. Would that person want to come back? 
You know, if I pick on somebody about the clothes they wear, they want to come back to church? No, they ain't come back. I put a pick on about how they sing, and I've done that already. There's one fellow that goes to the church up there where I used to go that he couldn't carry a tune if he had it wrapped up and tied shut in the sock. But, you know, but I pick on him about it, but it's all good. But if I keep picking on somebody about it and aggravating somebody, are they going to come to the church? No. Is that what Jesus would want me to do? A preacher told me the other day, he said, I'll make a joyful noise to the Lord. He said, that ain't to everybody else, it's to the Lord when I sing. And we do that. But you think about what Jesus Christ tells us to do. Go with him. If he tells you to go with him a mile, go with him two miles. But we don't do that because our human instinct tells us to take care of me. Remember what I said about all them other things a while ago? Them words, unforgiveness, selfishness, disagreements, unmerciless, they're all one eye. That eye is me, Roger. That's what people think about anymore. This is my church and this is what I want. We don't want a bunch of sinners in here and hell raisers and dope heads and things like that. They make us look bad. What did Jesus say? It ain't the good, the healthy it needs a physician. It's the sick people. Where's them people supposed to be? They're supposed to be here. They'd be welcome with a bunch of gospelers and hypocrites and judgmental people, wouldn't they? That's what we are. As humans, that's what we are. And we think them other fellows don't belong here. You know, think about that. You know, we're going to get to that directly about take the plank out of your own eye before you see the speck of sawdust in somebody else. But, you know, give to him that asks, and from him that would borrow, turn not away. You've heard it said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thy enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies and bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you and pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. Why are we supposed to do this? How are we supposed to do this? Is it easy? Is it easy to do that? Whether you're in church or not, if somebody walks up to you and gives you the awful cuss you ever had in your life, it's hard to smile at them and say, Jesus loves you, don't you know? It's a lot easier to walk over and hit him upside the head and hope he don't hit you back <laughs> anymore. But God don't want us to do that, people. That's why churches separate. If we don't agree on something, what do we need to do? And it tells you in the Bible, if one of the, one of the people in here messes up, does something really bad, what are we supposed to do? Three or four of us get a hold of him, throw him through that window there. No. It says go to him and talk to him. If I don't work, take somebody with you. Go to him. If I don't work, take the whole church with you. Pray for him. Talk to him. Get him back where he belongs. But do we do that or we just want to kick him out of here? That don't fit what we want. I'll tell you people, this building might be our building. Might be, I don't know who's assigned to, but this might be the Faith Mission Church is the building. The church is inside. The church is the people. Jesus told Peter, he said, upon this rock I will build my church. He wasn't talking about that, a rock there in the ground. If he did, it, he'd use a lot of rocks, wouldn't he? He was talking about his belief, being born again, the faith in Jesus Christ. That's what he was talking about. That's the church. But he said, what did he say after that? And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. They won't prevail against it, but Satan will sure try to separate it. Any which way he possibly can, he will try to separate it. And we've got to realize that. You know, if she makes me really mad, what am I going to do? Stay home next Sunday and pout? I could. I ain't going to that church no more. That won't make me mad. Or I could go to her and talk to her and we can work things out. That's what's wrong with marriages today. There's no communication. There's no giving. It's all taken. Remember the I word? I, I, I. That's all them words. Selfishness has only got one eye in it, I think. Maybe I spell wrong with a lot of things, so maybe they got more than one eye. 
Anyway, you can keep going with that. But why do we do this? Verse 45 in chapter 5 says, That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. If we're going to be Christian people, we've got to be Christ-like people. For he maketh the sun to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. Did you ever get mad? John was telling me a while ago, had rain in his house. Didn't rain in mine. Should I be mad at him about it? I don't direct the rain. God does. If his table grows and mine don't, should I be upset with him? Well, I don't know. Don't think so. You know, do we act like kids sometimes? Like children fighting over toys? Fighting over things that when we turn 16 years old won't make a hoot in the world difference to us? Yes. We do the same thing in churches. If Satan can get in your mind something that will turn you against somebody in this congregation, he will do it. If he can get in your mind something that will turn you against a tradition of this church, he will do it. You know, and I got to say this. I heard this past week, now I wasn't going to say it, but I am. That because the word of God needs to be preached, and it is. But I heard just a rumor that when somebody started singing last week in the church, that people got up and left. Because it was somebody singing in church. That's like going to a basketball game and leaving when they start playing basketball. If you go to a house of worship, yes, you're going to hear singing, I believe. Yeah, there's there's things that we don't, you know, I don't think that everybody ought to get up with this virus and sing at the top of your lungs and spit on people and blow whatever. No. But if you can't sing loud, sing in your heart. What I'm saying, the house of worship is for the house of worship. And we're going to do it. If I got anything to say about it, we're going to worship. Not sing and holler, but we're going to worship. You know, we're going to be safe. We're going to praise the Lord. We're going to hope that God, we're going to trust in God to keep us safe, is what we're going to do. But how's God going to do that? God's going to do that if we stick together in unity and believe in Him. God says if you pray for something and don't believe it, you ain't going to get it. If you do believe it, I'll give it to you. If you trust God, God will answer your prayer. If you act like you ain't supposed to, you're in trouble. It says, for if you love them that love you, what reward have you? Don't even the publicans do this? If you salute your brother only, why do ye more than others? Why do you, never, why do, you do that? You know, do we do that as church people? You know, I ain't, if he goes down the street and he waves at me, I ain't waving him. He don't go to our church. I'll tell you, he ain't never coming to your church if you don't wave to him. If you don't ever say hi to him, you walk around and act like that. That's another thing in church pride. Is our our church is better than that? Then people go to our church. They don't sit out here at the bar and drink. I see a lot of people from that church over there. They go to the bar and drink. They're doing all this. They're doing all that. They don't know they're sitting in the house at home drinking. They ain't drinking going to else. They don't see it. But, you know, prideful people. What did we say? That was another verse. It's in Romans. I wrote it down somewhere so I wouldn't forget it. Romans 3.10. It said, well, there is no, not one person that is righteous. And the scripture also said, if you say that you live without sin, that you're lying to yourself. You can't do that. You're not a righteous person. You can try to be, yes. You're not a sinless person. Jesus Christ was and still is, and he's the only one. You're human. You're flesh. Paul said, as long as we're in the flesh, we cannot please God because of our sinful nature. But we can get along with people. We can be, if you turn them words around, you can be forgiving. You can be a not unselfish person. You can think of others. You can be caring. You can have mercy on people. You can agree with people instead of disagreeing with people. You can make a few little adjustments here and there, exceptions. 
I'm not saying for the church to accept things are not right. No, not at all. But you can't tell me that if a car walks up here and plays electric, well, usually he stands over there. If a car walks up here and plays electric guitar and sings a song, a country song, that the people in the congregation is going to hell because we didn't play it on the piano. You know what I'm saying? You can't tell me that if we play contemporary Christian music all the time, one Sunday and the next Sunday sing old hymns that we're not following God. Because we're making a joyful noise unto the Lord and we're praising God in worship and in music. You know, you can you cannot go to a church because of things that are not acceptable to God, to the Lord Jesus Christ, or you cannot go to church because of things that you don't agree with. And there's a lot of things that people don't agree with. Like I said, not all of you like turnip. You know, some like chocolate cake, some like strawberry. I will not eat turnips. I don't like them. And I don't eat ice cream either. But anyway, dear meat's another story. But, you know, but Jean won't eat that. She don't like it. We all have different priorities. We all have different likes, dislikes, and opinions. But the opinion and dislikes or likes that we got to have is that Jesus Christ died for our sin and this is the guidebook to life and we got to follow it. Jesus Christ was resurrected and said through his resurrection as children of God we're also resurrected with him and have a chance for salvation and eternal life. And we got to believe that. If we believe that none of that piddly stuff matters. I'll tell you that. It might today, but go home and pray about it. Maybe it won't matter no more. You know, you just keep going, keep going. It says, but be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. If somebody told Roger Sager he was perfect, it, it's probably snow tonight. But anyway, I'll strive to be perfect, but I probably won't get there. If you go to Matthew 6, 14, 15 talks about forgiveness. And you this is something I really had to think about. There's, it, is it easy to hold grudges against people? If somebody in your church does something to make you mad, is it easy to hold the grudge against them? Yes, it is. But it says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you. Your trespasses. So the grudge you've been carrying around for the last 47 years, God's been right there with you. You know, it says that until you forgive that person, God ain't going to forgive you. You're still sinning, people, is what I'm saying. If you're not forgiving people and you're still judging people because of something that they did or something you heard that they done, I told before, and that's another thing. I said a while ago that the the people that we call the drunkards, the dope heads, the dirty people, the unclean people that's not welcome in our church, I don't know none of them people. I don't know any of them that's not welcome in our church. Because Jesus said it is the sick that need the physician, not the healthy. But all them people, you remember the parables in the Bible where Jesus said that he used the example of somebody having a big dinner and all the ones that were invited, that's us. They had an excuse and they left and went everywhere. The ones that were supposed to be there. What did he tell his servant? He said, go out in the byways and the streets and the brush outside and get up whoever you can find and bring them here. And that's what he did. Because the ones that were supposed to be there didn't show up. But it says not everybody that calls that says Lord, Lord will be entering the kingdom of God. You got to do more than just come to church. You got to be a Christian person. If you want your church to survive, whoever you may be, whatever church you may be, you invite the sick people in. It's like if sick people in a hospital. If people are sinners, they need to be in church. Because that's where they get better. I did. 
My dad took me to church and helped. That's why I'm standing up here today. If I'd have stayed home, like other people probably thought I should have, where would you be? If somebody, and witnessing, that's another thing. If we don't witness to these people, what kind of church are we? The responsibility of the church is to lead others to church, to lead others to God, to lead others to Christ. But do we do that? You need to go on and on. I had a lot more. If you go to Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 through 5, it says, Judge ye not, for what you judges, you shall be judged accordingly. And what measure you made, to be measured to you. It says, What beholdest thou the mote in thy brother's eye, when thou considerest not the beam in your own eye? You know, you see us, we talk about the speck of sawdust and somebody else, but about whatever somebody else is doing. And I've preached it many times in many a sermon. Which is the worst? The two fellows would sit over here to bar at night and get drunk and go home and be on their way and go to sleep? Or the three fellows that sits the next day in church and talks about it? Gossip. The most asked questions in a church is, have you heard and do you know? That's the wrong question. It should be, does he know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? And do you want to? That should be the two most asked questions in church. But it's not. As humans, we're apt to gossip. You know, if you see something happen, you can't wait to tell somebody. Me and, uh, what's his name? That little fellow there. Yeah. <laughs> Gabriel Davis. Yeah. Me and him the other day, we seen the fellow hit a bear on a motorcycle. Well, we just dismissed it anyway. But we couldn't wait to go tell somebody else about it. Same way, if you see somebody doing something, 